be settled. Collingwood crashed out today against Fitzroy and Carlton secured its position in the finals with another great revival coming from six goals behind North Melbourne to get up and win at Princes Park. The other teams in the five all won. Percentage boosters too. Fitzroy, Hawthorne and Essendon jostling for positions in the top three. Footscray staged the revival of the day though, kicking nine goals to one in the last quarter to get up and beat St Kilda by a goal down at Moorabbin. Our replay at 6.30 is the second quarter of the Fitzroy Collingwood match from the junction. Our special guest tonight is Keith Gregg and we'll have interviews with Bill Picken and Robert Klomp. Among the goals, well Bernie Quinlan didn't kick too many, just three, but he became the first ever Fitzroy player and the 16th in league history to kick 100 goals in a season. Kent Hunter kicked seven for Carlton and six each kicked by Michael Tuck and Terry Danaher. A few reports, Peter Bazasto on two separate charges, Mario Bortolotto and Donald McDonald, three players out at Princes Park, getting their names written into the book, and Mike Richardson of Collingwood also reported. First match for review is the match at the Junction Oval, where uh, Fitzroy accounted for Collingwood very convincingly, winning by 64 points. After uh, trailing by a goal at quarter time, the Lions took over in the second term. Scott kicked four goals, Ruse, Gotch and Quinlan three each, and no one kicked more than one for the disappointing Magpies, Doug Hayward and Ian Robertson. And it's the second time, Doug, in 20 years that Collingwood have uh, missed the finals in two consecutive years. Well, you used the term disappointing, Tim. Uh, it was a pathetic performance, and I'm quite certain that Collingwood will reassess their whole club and team tonight, and there'll be a real clean-out at the end of the year. When you think that at the 14-minute mark in the first quarter, they'd kick three goals, and about 70 minutes later, two quarters later, at the 22-minute mark, they got their fourth, I am absolutely certain they are faced with a complete clean-out, and Collingwood members get ready for more of the checkbook warfare because they'll have to get some more players. When you think they are playing for a place in the final five, it simply wasn't good enough. I guess there are only about three players you could mention. Uh, Philip Walsh, probably the recruit of the year, was quite inspiring in the first half in particular. Stewart did a reasonable job on Bernie Quinlan and Fellows. Apart from that, there wasn't a player worth mentioning. Some wonderful stoppers for Fitzroy. Cameron, um, Cameron Clayton, Scott Clayton, Number 40 for Fitzroy has done it so often, kept good players out of the game. Today he made Peter Dacos completely ineffectual and Peter looks as if he wasn't even interested in the game. And Mike Richardson was put out by little Leon Harris. And I think it was frustration that caused this report. Wonderful performance by them. Big Mark, Mark Scott did a wonderful job at centre-half forward. But for Fitzroy, everybody played well. And later on, really, all the interest was in Bernie Quinlan. When would he get that 100th goal? The 99th goal was a gift. He didn't take the mark that he was awarded and he kicked a goal. And I guess it was fitting that Quinlan's 100th goal is a real super big one. To go ...because the ground clock hasn't worked in this final term. Quinlan running out of time for his second goal, but uh, nobody knows how much he's running out. Gotch, lead by Quinlan. He's got it. Right on the line in the centre square. He's kicked them from here at this ground before. A slight breeze behind, but it would have to be a 65-metre kick. It's close. It's very close. Well, what a sensational effort by Bernie. He's done just about everything now except uh, perhaps play successfully in a final series, uh, which will come up in a few weeks' time. Uh, Doug's mentioned about Fitzroy stoppers. Uh, their defence, which uh, has a few unheralded players, Coleman in the back pocket was a very, very strong player all day long. Uh, they were very, very well led by Serafini. I'm a uh, big rap for Laurie Serafini, a tremendous player. He brings so many other players into the game with his handball. I guess that uh, teams have to look at players like Serafini and Glenn Denning and put stoppers on these attacking defenders. Francis to Serafini. Serafini, the lovely runner. Off he goes and will drive to the full forward zone. And he drives for goal. And that was marked by Scott. I agree with you, and I think he's almost the most important player on the side, is uh, Lorenzo Serafini. He's a wonderful runner and a real fighter. Laurie also on the back line is another one who creates opportunities. And uh, I mentioned earlier Mark Scott, who took that mark. Four wonderful goals, some lovely tap-ons. Some of the younger players were good in little Bradley Gotch. Uh, Pert was out, but this young man, Ruse, who's getting the uh, Perivic treatment, Ruse, 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 they call so often when he gets the ball, he can play key position or on the flank, and he was a wonderful player today, and the best man on the ground was Matt Rendell, I thought. Rendell winning again. Nettlefold. Logan. Good running by Fitzroy. Wilson. Osborne. Great stuff out of the middle. Badly directed kick again. Drop short of Pickham. At the back. Beautiful hand pass from Scott. On to Ruse. Goal to Paul Ruse. Great football, Fitzroy. 
Well, that was typical of their performance for most of the game, particularly from quarter time onwards when they kicked 17 goals to three and uh, went right on with it uh, and had a very great victory, which was a tonic for them coming up to the finals. Looking at Collingwood, uh, I think they're very much top heavy. They're very slow. They need uh, definitely need one, perhaps two Rovers. Uh, we have to give credit, I guess, to uh, Craig Stewart. He frustrated Bernie on uh, every occasion. And the Collingwood Ruckman, who went down into defence and uh, created a blockade in front of Quinlan as well. Stewart done very well, and he thumps it down to centre half for David Cloak. That was a big leap from a big frame. Incidentally, David Cloak was taken off, which is uh, sad for David. Last year it happened at Richmond, now at Collingwood, and he was one of their expensive buys. But uh, really, the man who looked the player and was an inspiring young man was Walsh. His first year player from Hamilton. I said earlier, I think he probably is the recruit of the year, and it was quite ironic to see a young man in his first season trying to inspire his teammates around him. That's how good he is. More height than distance, but not a bad one. Cloak's a big jumper from behind again. Punched away nicely by Coleman. Kicked high in the air by Ania. Underneath it, the chances there. Oh, good football. Walsh again. Walsh, a left foot snap is a beauty. An absolute beauty. Well, one bright spot in a bad year for the Magpies. What, what about the Lions? They're in there with a chance, and while everyone's been talking, well, Carlton lately, but North Melbourne and Hawthorne, uh, they're one of the, the quiet achievers, as uh, we've heard so often yes, this year. Yeah. I think that's true, Tim. I think in this game now that uh, people have dramatic reversals of form, of form with this running game, and Fitzroy, when they get running, are as good as anybody, and they look beaut today. And don't forget that side bottom's out. Mickey Conlon only came on, I think, in the second term and hardly had any contribution, so there's good players out of the side going to be hard to pick the right side for Robert Walls, but he's a splendid coach. Well, we'll see over the next few weeks. And uh, that holy grail still proving elusive for the Magpies, 25 years now without a premiership. But yet again this year, one man who can hold his head up is Bill Picken, who looks to be a real chance to win his first Copeland Trophy. After this match, he spoke to Drew Morford. Well, Bill, you've missed out for the season, can't make the finals, but it looked today as though it's just, a, just as well you don't. Yeah, the way we played today was uh, very ordinary. Um, uh, probably glad we, we're not going to make it, but, uh, you know, uh, it's disappointing for our supporters and uh, everybody else connected with the club that we couldn't have performed better in an important game. People keep talking about an apparent lack of system, and in, early in the season they were making excuses about all the new players, but surely by 21 rounds you should have some. Yes, our system uh, today broke down completely. Uh, our handball was very sloppy. Uh, our method of delivering the ball up forward was very poor. I would have hate to have been playing in the forward line. Whereas Fitzroy's uh, method of develop, um, delivering the ball to their forward line was extremely good and it made it very hard for us because uh, you know, the, their forward line was very open and they, they ran the ball well out of their back line and uh, you know, made it created a lot of opportunities for their forwards. Billy Picken, who surely has deserved something better for his great service over the years. Well, Hawthorne remained in the top three with a crushing win over Melbourne at VFL Park. In fact, the Hawks, after a 10-goal second quarter, led by a mass of 73 points at half-time, and they eventually won by 115 points. Tuck, returning, kicked six goals. Four each to Wallace and Brereton, and for Melbourne, Flower kicked three, and Peter Moore, two. And Doug Bigelow was at VFL Park to see the Hawks trounce the Demons. Yes, I wasn't very enthusiastic about the performance throughout, but Hawthorne, of course, were excellent. Every player, almost to a man, was doing something. It was rather unfortunate for Melbourne, in all fairness to them. Their, their supporters really have got a worrying summer because at some stage during this football season, many stages in fact, they have given sight of great improvement, but it wasn't there today. But Ick was injured early in the piece, put his foot in one of those treacherous VFL potholes, is the report. And of course, Flower was on one leg and spent the greater part of his time at full forward. And to find good players in the Melbourne side was pretty difficult indeed. O'Donnell was a good player for them. He battled uh, quite well. Uh, Russell Richards uh, showed a bit of fire and uh, determination. But full credit to Hawthorne, where Wallace once again with marvellous statistics. They never really worry me stats, but he had 35 kicks today. And the first player since statistics have been taken to kick, uh, fi get 500 kicks in a season. So it'll give you some idea just how he loves the leather on the boot. A wonderful performance from him. Knights uh, was a good player for them. Tuck made a welcome return with six goals. And overall, almost every Hawthorne player did something. They got a leisurely approach to the finals with the easy win today. They played you long next week. And I think they'll give lots of cheek. But Melbourne, a worrying time ahead and a pretty bleak future because some of the better players that they have purchased were not nearly good enough today. 
Well, the glamour clash of the day was at Prince's Park. The only two teams in the top five to actually meet. And Carlton accounted for North Melbourne in much the same style as they did Hawthorne last week. They were 36 or 37 points down late in the second quarter, but then stormed back and eventually won the game by 33 points. They kicked seven goals to three in the third quarter and five goals to one in the last. A 33-point margin in the end with Hunter kicking seven, Ditchburn three for Carlton, and for North, four each to Jim Cracker and Stephen McCann. Three reports out there, Bazasto on two charges, Bortolotto and McDonald. Keith Gregg to talk to us later on, but first up, Ray Walker and Don Hyde. Ray. Well, Tim, uh, it was a great effort again by Carlton today. There's six win in a row. It was really a game of two halves. North Melbourne with their skill, their pace, their teamwork, their backing up. The Cracker Brothers on fire. Schimmelbush doing well. Abernethy in the centre. Uh, Dempsey doing a good job for them in the ruck. They had McCann on top at centre half forward and Glenn Dinning controlling the back line. But then that Carlton machine, they did their Lazarus act again. They were resurrected from the dead in that third quarter and they're absolutely superb. I thought some of their uh, positional changes had a real effect on this game. Dual went to centre half back to cut uh, McCann out of the game. Bordelotto couldn't do that job. They put Johnson, the dominator, in the centre again. He finished with 32 possessions. And one of the telling moves was to bring Ruck Rover uh, Rowan Burke onto the ground. We know him as a half-back flanker. Today he did a great job. He won 18 possessions after quarter time. He took Schimmelbush out of the game and won the ball out of that important centre bounce. It was a fine performance. They had two great match winners today, Carlton. One up forward in Ken Hunter. A great game with seven goals but the man of the match for four quarters was Wayne Harms. What a thrilling performance in the back pocket. He's absolutely superb. He marked magnificently. He cleared with those telling dashes, and uh, his kicking to position was something to see. But good tactics. Down towards the north half forward. Wayne Harms, what a great mark! There was speculation before the game as to who would play at centre-half forward for Carlton, and uh, some people said, what about Mark Buckley? Well, that's where he lined up. Mark Buckley, this uh, young, uh, still uh, a rookie player who hasn't had a great deal of experience, was given the unenviable task of playing against Ross Glendinning, who played a magnificent game and put Glendinning right out of business. Tackled by Wayne Harms on Jimmy Cracker, and the Carlton man moves the ball out to Glascott. Glascott on the centre wing, and the Blues firing now to Ditchburn, to Wayne Johnson. Johnson tackled, gets rid of the tackle, across to Mark Buckley. Buckley into the Carlton, goal! I thought the big difference after half time was the uh, excellent play by the Carlton small men. Marku, Ashman, Sheldon was a very good player today, had 34 possessions. And they also had some great players up forward. Uh, Don, you mentioned uh, Mark Buckley. But uh, Hunter today in a forward pocket playing on Carlton was too skilled, too elusive. And I thought that uh, he was the real class forward of the day. A great effort by Ken Hunter, marked as well as usual and put through those goals from uh, every angle. Playing in attack, he seems to be reaping the rewards for all his hard work over the years in defence because while he really earned some of them, uh, he got some the easy way because of those great setups down the ground. Well, he certainly had great players down the ground uh, giving him the ball, but uh, also you and I talked about it, Tim. Uh, he seems to have more room to move on the forward line, and uh, he's such a talented player that uh, really he just capped it all off today with those great seven goals. I thought uh, one of the uh, uh, the big factors in the game was Carlton's dominance across the centre. Ray's already mentioned uh, Johnson. Glasgow was a great player on the other wing and a player who I thought came of age in VFL ranks today. Carlton had been waiting a long time for him to put a game like this together was Frank Marcazzani and his goal late in the second quarter was one of the goals that started to get Carlton right back in the game. A good effort by Marcazzani. McCann in ruck. Dool, nice knock on to Sheldon. He works it back to the wing. Mark Buckley up in front and has paid the mark. But uh, in the air, Carlton have struggled down the middle of the ground. Their forwards haven't been able to take a mark in the air, with one or two exceptions like that. He finds Marcazzani, who goes long. And where does it go? It's a goal! What a beauty! The North Melbourne attack looked very good early. They had Jonas playing today at full forward on Southby. Got away well early in the game. I thought his pace was a bit of a worry to Jeff, but he tightened up after half-time to be a very good player. Donald McDonald started the game well on a half-forward flank. 
but their telling forward early in the game was McCann. He kicked three early goals, looked good, kicked another one on Duel, had four goals up at half time. And uh, McCann this year has really emerged as a top forward playing at centre half forward. Taken by Roy Ramsey in defence on North's half back line, kicks it back towards their attacking zone on the half forward line. McCann again. Gee, what a great mark he is and how well he's marked today. And North leading by four goals at the moment. McCann within range, but it'll be a good goal if he kicks from here. It's straight. Oh, gee, that's a great kick by McCann. He's done it again, and that's his fourth goal. Whereas McCann played brilliantly in the first half, uh, Bruce Duell uh, did the job on him in the second half and, uh, and I thought put him out of the game. Perhaps the best North Melbourne player today was one of their running players and one wonders without uh, these two brothers, Jim and Phil Cracker, uh, will North be a force in the finals? I don't think they would be. Jimmy Cracker was tremendous, he was North's best player and he kicked four great goals. North into attack again, down towards Stephen McCann at uh, half forward, McDonald over the top. And uh, there's the mark taken in front by Cracker. How the heck did he get that? Jimmy Cracker. Cracker moves it quickly into the full forward zone. And Zona and Jonas. Well, our special guest, as I mentioned earlier, Keith Gregg, who unfortunately wasn't able to line up with the Roos today due to a knee injury. But, uh, Keith, I suppose watching from the sidelines, you perhaps could learn something. Yes, it was a game of uh, two halves today, Tim. I thought we played exceptionally well in the first half. Probably the last four minutes off the second second quarter let Carlton get back in with three goals and of course they played so well in the remaining two quarters. Did you think the skirmishing uh, could have had any effect on the, the turnaround in the game? None at all. Not from our point of view it didn't. Do you think that type of thing happens uh, by design or is it just the pressure of a big game? I think the pressure of the, uh, the game today was, uh, well it was a final I suppose for Carlton as well as North Melbourne. We wanted to beat them because if we do happen to play them in the finals again we've got the, uh, the knowledge of beating them twice in this year. Carlton have to keep on winning to make the five and they, that's what they did today. Well what do teams do to stop these uh, Carlton turnarounds? Obviously they really gear themselves up when they're struggling at half time and you have to go even harder than you have done in a good first half yeah. to keep them out, keep them down. Well we're, we've been aware of Carlton's uh, exceptional third quarters and we went out to try and stop that. Um, what happened then they put Dill onto McCann and uh, that shut down one of our avenues of attack and uh, when that kept on happening the ball was kept uh, going back into Carlton's forward line a lot more quickly than what it was in the first half. Keith, it must be a worry to you though, despite what you say, to be six goals up on a team like Carlton and they still beat you. That must be a real worry going into the finals. Well, I don't think it is, Don. I think uh, that can happen to any side that uh, is in the position that, uh, of the top five teams this, for this year. I think uh, that situation can happen from week to week and I'm not necessarily because it was Carlton today, but I think uh, Hawthorne, Fitzroy, can do it the same sort of thing as what happened today because of the running game as you mentioned before. Keith what about your own injury? Uh, will you be back next week? I'll train Monday and Tuesday. I'll have a, a light run tomorrow and uh, hopefully be right for, for next Saturday. You mentioned Steve McCann and uh, the, the fact that he was held had a big impact on the, the mm. way the game changed in the second half. He really seems to have developed this year. Well unfortunately for Stephen uh, he doesn't realise his full potential as a footballer and probably this year uh, the games he has played, he's been more consistent, and we know that there's that much more to, to get out of Stephen McCann, but just to, to try and convince him to do it each Saturday. And the, Don and Ray talked about Buckley's performance on Glendinning. Do you envisage a situation where teams really are sending out a centre-half forward virtually to put Glendinning out of business? Well, the way Ross plays, he's so attacking. Um, he probably gives us three or four goals from his own initiatives from centre-half back. I don't think Carlton actually put uh, Mark Buckley on Glendinning to stop him because uh, uh, Mark's such a good player himself. But the, the game that Ross was playing today, I don't think suited himself. He was more worried about the ball going over his head and he didn't have the attacking uh, side of his game that he usually has. Well, it was a tremendous game to watch, I thought, but uh, I guess having, you. <laughs> having to watch it uh, makes you think you won't retire for a few more years. Yeah, if uh, football's played like that, and I think the crowd enjoyed it today, um, all goes well. That's all good for football. Good. Thanks for joining us, Keith, and good luck in the finals. Thank you. Keith Gregg. Well, the revival of the, the round came down at uh, Moorabbin, where Footscray played St Kilda, and the Saints looked to have it all wrapped up at three-quarter time when they led by 39 points. But Footscray kicked nine goals, one in the last quarter, to St Kilda's 1-4, and got up and won by a goal. Major goal kickers, Beasley and Gorazidis, three each for the winners. For the Saints, two each to Mace, Cross, Lockett and Meehan. Kevin Coglin and Jeff Leek were down at Moravan and uh, what happened?
was greater? Well, it was an incredible game. It started out as probably the worst game of foot football you'd ever want to watch. And uh, the second quarter at least gave some life and character to the game when St Kilda set a win on the board. And that's what they did. They set a win on the board and they underlined that win in the, th in the third quarter. They got to 45 points. They had Burns winning beautifully in the centre. Mace, Sharon, Cross, side bottom. They had ample players to really wrap up this game. And then they seemed to stop dead. As a matter of fact, uh, Tony Jewell apparently after the game when they allowed Footscray to kick 9-1 in the last quarter refused to speak to his players. I had This was one of the uh, reports from a journalist who went into the rooms and he called them a mob of lairs. Now that may not be a, such a bad summary because they fell back into the habits of kicking around the boundary, kicking the ball backwards, hand passing backwards and from 45 points up almost uh, into the time on period of the third quarter they stopped dead as though they were shot and in fact they allowed the, the, the time break at three quarter time allowed Footscray to regroup. They started to see the, the chinks in the armour of St Kilda and the, the Bulldogs starting through Gorazidis with a couple of goals. Lunn running out of the back line, Klomp doing particularly well. Uh, forwards coming out of the game, into the game but they hadn't been there before, Beasley and the, the scores were level twice in the uh, last quarter and then right on the 28, 29 minute mark Williams, Ian Williams took a mark, half forward flank about 45 to 50 metres on about a 45 degree angle and he was in a position where he even a point would have done, he did better than that. Incidentally that was a very fine uh, performance by McQueen. By Williams, 30 minutes on the clock Jeff but we've had nine goals this quarter. Now Williams will go for the goal of course and he's kicking over about 50 metres. It's a long kick, it won't quite make the distance, Beasley got up, it's touched by Gorazidis, Parker doesn't believe it, the siren's gone, the siren's gone and St, St Kilda have been beaten by Footscray, Trevor Barker can't believe that last decision, Footscray. Well what a way to win, <laughs> the last kick of the day and I put this down to the greatest steal since the great train robbery I'm still scratching my head to, uh, to find reasons why uh, Footscray got up and won this game but Skeeter's already explained that to you but I think Footscray can th more than thank uh, some of their smaller players for the, for the get up and go last quarter when they did kick that uh, nine goals to St Kilda's one to take the game away mostly to their smaller running players Duper Rizzle did a great job the day for them Young Simmons booted two fine goals in the final quarter McKenna was a great player all day for them, but uh, uh, young Royal, who I would say is their star country recruit of the, of the year, was instrumental in really getting the, and clapping on the pace in that final term. Footscray within about a kick and a half. Here they go anyway, from train of handballs with Cordy on the end of it, quickly across towards Royal, Royal can kick it from here, let's go along with it, it's another one of the three or four they need, yes it's three, great play uh, from Footscray coming out of the... Well, Andrew Purser came to Footscray with a great reputation and certainly proved that that was justified early in the season. But since I've seen Footscray about four times and I've yet to see Purser play a, a very good game. Today he lined up against Alan Sidebottom and uh, Alan Sidebottom, another former Western Australian, proved that he was more than a match in the centre bounces and did a very good job around the ground for the Saints and at one stage kicked an excellent goal. A good bounce this way, that away. Has a look from 40 metres out. Cross goal towards side bottom. Good ball, oh, nearly a good mark. I almost declared it. He still played it well. Kicks it. Oh, great stuff on the side bottom. Well, St Kilda have only themselves to blame for it. They all sat back in the armchair in the last quarter and let Footscray race away from them. Some very disappointed players who uh, played very well uh, right throughout the game. Burns, his centre player, who had a, a great match against Hawkins, would be the most disappointed player because he had a good match. Base. Purser should have taken that one. Oh, basketball, but it wasn't a, wasn't a mark. Cross gets it away quickly towards Burns. Burns had a shot. Up in it as he kicks the ball. And that's breaking through. And that's a beaut goal. And that's really made things tick for the Saints. They bounced. This pity is suspension put him out of contention for the Brownlow medal. Well, Footscray with uh, two wins on the trot and the Bulldogs now with a real chance of taking out that incentive money of something more than uh, $20,000 that they were offered by their sponsors if they could win the last three matches and good to see them coming back. And a player who has helped lift them apparently is Robert Klomp who came from Carlton when he couldn't get a game in that Carlton defence. He spoke to Peter Booth after the match. 45 points down midway through the third term, 39 points down at three quarter time. What did Louis Hampshire say at the break? Well, he was just particularly interested in us having a real go because we, we hadn't got our running game going and we really rely on that and uh, there had been a lot of players down on the day 
and we just felt, we all felt that if we'd really stuck to our task and, uh, and played on at opportunity, or every opportunity and took risks, that at least, you know, we'd, we'd have a show. Any comparison with the clubs, Carlton and, say, a lesser-known club in Footscray? Well, there are a lot of comparisons. I, I really believe that Footscray have a depth of talent. Uh, it's just that the players themselves aren't quite aware of just what they can do. And I think in the last two weeks, they've started to realise that, that with a bit of perseverance and uh, not so much on the physical side, but more uh, mentally, you know, right through the game, that if they stick with it and concentrate right through, that the games are there to be won. And let's hope they can win plenty more in 1984. Well, Essendon stayed in the fight for a spot in the top three with a percentage booster against Geelong at Cadinia Park. The Dons winning by 82 points after racing away in the first term. Terry Danaher, six goals. Kink, another four, along with Madden. And for the Cats, Tui topped the billing with three goals. And Gareth Andrews, just in from Cadinia Park, didn't enjoy watching his old team. I would uh, venture to predict. Well, I certainly didn't, Tim. A big grey cloud hung over Cadinia Park today. And as far as Geelong's future is concerned... There's also a big cloud hanging, hanging over that because today's performance was absolutely pathetic by the Cats. Their skill level was so low, I've never seen it lower. The way in which they executed their handball was totally sloppy and really reminiscing, reminiscent of historic football, football of about 20 or 30 years ago. Prehistoric, maybe. Prehistoric, yeah, it was absolutely terrible. They put no pressure on the Essendon side and really it was very hard to evaluate the Essendon game with the finals coming up. But there were a few pluses as far as Essendon was concerned. It was a meritorious victory, and I think those pluses came from Neagle. I felt that his performance across the centre line was excellent, and his return to form is something that Essendon is really looking forward to. Hawker on the half-forward line I felt was tremendous. That much maligned Essendon defence, OK, it may not be as talented as many of the others in the finals, but it's tough and tenacious, and with Danaher up on that forward line scoring goals, I think that Essendon, if they can get past that elimination final, are going to be a good side and a good competitor in this final series. OK, so the Cats' season fizzling out uh, fairly disappointingly. Can the Bombers do better than fifth this year? Well, now it's replay time, and our replay comes from the Junction Oval, where Collingwood headed Fitzroy at quarter time by a goal. And we pick it up in the first couple of minutes of the second quarter with commentators Drew Morfitt and Doug Hayward. There's a huge pack of players now. area now as they bounce it. Play Williams, Osmond, Serafini the dasher, Wilson the great ball runner. Well there's a case where the dweller with a great tackle which was Miles takes it away from the man who made all the play and got the ball in Wilson. Miles kicks downfield, Cloak goes up with his opponent Coleman, Laurie looking good today to Clayton. Clayton drives it wide to Quinlan. Quinlan out racing his opponent this time. Well, they're in trouble here, Fitzroy. Umpire calls for it and will ball it up. Well, all starting from a very bad hand pass from a very quiet Bernard Quinlan. Well played, Rendell. Dacos fights for it, taken away from him. Richardson played Harris. Here's a chance now for Loken. Kicked off the ground and downfield there from Fitzroy, Serafini. Phillips. Shaw. Ania will shoot for goal and kicks it off direction through for one behind. Grant Laurie straight up the ground. Oh, bad kick. Straight to Phillips. Coleman had no chance of beating him with that ball. 